afternoon. Uh, for those of you who might not have been with us uh, earlier this morning, I'm Ian Lesser from the uh, GMF office in Brussels. Before we start this session um, this afternoon, we wanted to give you just a little bit of context on the, the reason for this conversation. Um, two years ago, GMF, uh, in partnership with the OCP Foundation in Morocco, uh, launched a major initiative looking at the wider Atlantic. And the purpose of this really is to try to reset mental maps, if I can put it that way, to uh, get people thinking about uh, transatlantic relations, not just in terms of the north-north axis between Brussels and Washington, uh, but actually in north-south terms, in south-south terms. In other words, to think about the Atlantic Basin as a whole, very much including Latin America, including Atlantic Africa, and including the Caribbean. We have a number of pieces to this work, and you see some of them uh, around the room here, in fact. Uh, we've done a lot of research over the last two years, and you see some of these products here. Uh, for next year, we're going to be looking very heavily at the geoeconomics of the region, how trade and finance patterns are changing and changing north-south relations in the Atlantic. Another big aspect of this, and you see that as well, uh, is something that we're calling the Atlantic Dialogues. Uh, this is a big new forum. It's uh, now going to be in its second uh, year at full scale. Uh, and we're very grateful again for our partnership with the OCP Foundation uh, to make this possible. It, it happens annually in Rabat. Uh, it's patterned on Brussels Forum, this scale, uh, this setup. Uh, and the next one will be October 25th to 27th in Rabat again. And we hope to see many of you there uh, with us. Uh, let me uh, say, uh, before I turn it over to our moderator, uh, that there's another important piece to this, which is the role being played by emerging actors uh, in the Atlantic, especially in the South Atlantic, Brazil, uh, Mexico, South Africa, uh, but also, as we've tried to incorporate in this panel, uh, actors, important actors and stakeholders from outside the Atlantic Basin itself, like China and India. So we're very pleased to have this uh, discussion this afternoon. Uh, and we're very pleased to have Lisa Mullins from Public Radio with us to moderate it. So please, Lisa, over to you. As political developments and the spread of capital and technology empower Southern Atlantic societies, South Africa, Brazil, and Mexico, among others, are looking for new venues of influence through the Atlantic highways. What are the political and economic implications of a more global Atlantic? Are new trends strengthening cooperation or creating conditions for future conflicts? I have to say it is a total privilege to be here uh, hosting a panel. I was in Rabat, Morocco. That was my first experience with the German Marshall Fund, and I am thrilled to be back here today with such a, um, an esteemed group of panelists, and especially to be moderating the final panel of the Brussels Forum. Um, we are talking, of course, about a fragile world, but mostly we are here to see, to witness, to be inspired by the commitment of all of you who are committed to nurturing this fragile world and figuring out how to heal it in the broken places. On this panel, we're gonna be talking about challenges and I hope you will also help us talk about meaningful solutions before we part today. Uh, I know that journalists often get accused of uh, foregoing issues of nuance and focusing on black and white and things that are too practical, I intend to do just that. And I hope that you'll join me. Forgive me and then join me. Uh, and I'm going to be coming to you fairly soon for questions. So please think of questions. Please keep them very short and uh, address them to uh, any of the panelists who you wish. And I've invited the panelists to also respond to each other. So for our esteemed panel, first, starting from the far left uh, here is Victor Borges. He is from Cape Verde, Africa, president of the Foundation for Development and International Exchanges. Um, and then next to him is uh, Dr. Jorge Castaneda, professor at New York University. He is originally from Mexico, but now in that little land above the border, and he gets voted best socks of the forum. Um, <laughs> 
from Brazil, the Honorary Tatiana Prezeres, who is the Secretary of Foreign Trade and the, uh, at the Ministry of Development, Industry, and Foreign Trade. And then on the far right from China, Dr. Shi Yin Hong, Professor of International Relations and Director of the Center on American Studies at Remnant University of China. Okay, and as you probably know by now, there are many people who are joining us on the web live. Uh, so for those listening on the web, the, the new actors who we are speaking about as we talk about new actors in an old sea, the old sea of course being the Atlantic, they are not new countries but they are newly energized countries, in some cases quite literally energized. Uh, Brazil, Mexico, some of the countries of Africa and countries that have growing influence in transatlantic affairs including China and India and beyond. Tatiana, I would love to begin with you first. What is your characterization of where Brazil sits on the international stage right now, because from most accounts, it's sitting pretty. What do you say? Well, Brazil is uh, willing to, pl to play an, an even more important role in the international scenario, and we're confident that we can contribute positively to the world's uh, prosperity, increased democracy, to the world's security. We know that it entails responsibility. We're doing our part. And there are many factors to that, and you're going to be talking about them as well. It's kind of a, a, a multi-layered situation, and I hope that many people will respond to Brazil's um, posture uh, in terms of transatlantic affairs as we go on. Jorge Castaneda, through your American-based lens now, talk about whether you see America on the decline, whether you see Europe on the decline, and what the, the, uh, the uh, current state of affairs means for Mexico and Latin America as they're on the ascent. Well, I, I certainly don't think the United States is on the decline. If they were, they couldn't make socks like these. So, uh, I Are think you sure they were made in America? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Paul Smith. But um, yeah. that, that said, uh, I think that American design, American imagination, innovation, and cultural and ideological uh, <clears throat> hegemony, I think, is still the proper word, is more reality than, than ever before. That doesn't mean that there aren't new actors in individual aspects. Clearly, China has an immense plays an immense economic role today in the world. Uh, because of sheer population, India has an extraordinarily important role to play. Brazil in the Western Hemisphere has also a very enormous impact. But this notion of American decline, uh, if you look at it a little more objectively and beyond the newspaper headlines, uh, in tribute to what you said about journalism, Lisa, um, I think that there is less decline there than meets the eye. Uh, and what about Mexico on the rise, on the ascent? Well, I think we're doing about as well as we did before. Someone said a few weeks ago in Mexico with a group of uh, friends from the German Marshall Fund who visited us, when Brazil was doing great and we were doing lousy, we were growing at 3%. Now that Brazil is doing lousy and we're doing great, we're growing at 3%. Um, I think that's a, a fair <laughs> appraisal of it. I think there might be uh, other people representing uh, Mexico here or from Latin America who might disagree with that, and I would love to hear from them. I'd love to hear from Let's them. Get to yes, excellent. Uh, okay, um, Dr. Yin Hong, where does China sit on the international stage? Because we know, for one thing, it takes up a lot of space. I think that, the, especially in recent years, and everyone says that China is everywhere. China is sitting every chair. I don't think so. And of course, China's you know overseas you know uh, presence is mainly most prominently and most widely in economic front. And we have uh, econ presence and newly establishing in Africa, Latin America, Middle East, Central Asia, and so and so. And uh, but uh, diplomatically also, and uh, because China is uh, a big country, because China is a per member of the Council of the Nations, maybe our diplomatic representatives are all around the world. But strategically, I think that China still, and if you take a global perspective, very you know, modest, very the, the, the prudent and the low profile player. I, I, I don't think that China have any strategic presence in Latin America, for example. And China have no, Absolutely no strategic presence, strictly speaking, in Africa, and, uh, and not in almost the Indian Ocean. And what China and strategic concern with is only in East Asia and uh, along our, you know, peripheral, of course. And we also have some and uh, limited strategic concern and in 
in, in our, you know, the, 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 the border and uh, with our great friend India and also in something in Central Asia. But, but generally, I think that if you take a global picture, China definitely is not a strategic guy, but we are economic and diplomatic guy. Maybe economically, I think that the, this is the greatest you know, China national achievements since Deng Xiaoping's great reform and opening up and finally, and maybe a little too much, but the, roughly speaking, now everywhere is made in China and everywhere is Chinese. Yeah, didn't we hear in one of the earlier sessions on China that uh, the new president is saying we do not, uh, we, we intend to move forward, but incrementally. So you're saying that China does not represent, does not have strategic designs on, uh, on uh, other, other partners, including Africa, in terms of uh, um, uh, asserting itself hegemonically. You're saying that that doesn't exist. I, I think that a strategy is uh, some, you know, magic, you know, word. Strategy is a magic word. Sometimes yeah. you, you know, define them very broadly, and I think that China maybe have a very broad, you know, strategic interest. But if you define it as, uh, you know, in its strict meaning and relating to military, I think that I can confidently, very confidently say that at least in the, in the next five years, even perhaps in the next ten years, I don't think that China will any will have any strategic, you know presence, strategic uh, the, the basis, or uh, strictly defined in you know, distant continents. Okay, one of the things that I learned um, talking with so many of you throughout this conference is that you can get multipolar opinions, that I would talk to one person who was very vociferous about what he or she was saying, and then I find somebody else who is equally vociferous in the opposite direction. I'd like to turn it over to the audience right now, and perhaps um, if there's anyone who, why don't we start, do you want to start with China? Is that your, your main point? If we can get a microphone right here. Um, uh, so anyone who disagrees with that right now, and then we'll move on to the other regions as well. Yes, my name is Emil Mayberg. I'm an attorney from Johannesburg. Um, first of all, I must just make a comment that I don't see any South African on this panel, which I find a bit funny. But having said that, uh, Professor, I honestly cannot agree that China, or understand how China can say that it has no strategic interests in Africa. Could you please explain that because, and I've asked this question to you in Rabat, um, China's activities in Africa is causing resentment towards other investors going into Africa because China is not creating jobs for Africans. Answer? Yes, you yeah, can go ahead. I think that, of course, and uh, I said that China no strategic, will not have strategic presence in distant continents. And uh, strictly speaking, and, and uh, military, you know, Chinese soldiers never send there except as, uh, you know, UN's, UN peacekeeping troops under Security Council's mandate. And of course, and uh, China's search for minerals, gas, oil, for example, in Africa, and these are, you know, have a strategic meaning. But generally, direct motivation is not strategic. It is economic deployment. You should shake uh, off your hands. And I think that, the, you know, you, 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 you can provide evidence. What is China's, strictly speaking, strategic presence in Africa? So this raises the question of, uh, of uh, you say, Chinese, uh, bringing in Chinese instead of Africans in <clears throat> its African investments. And of course, we know that much of this is based on domestic uh, economics. You're disagreeing with that. Yeah, OK, thank you. Uh, yes, and then we'll go to Victor Borges right afterwards. Um, Peter, Kel Peter Kellner from uh, YouGov um, polling Sorry, company. Give me your name once again. My name is Peter Kellner. I I'm, I'm run a polling company in Britain called YouGov. But my question is this. Um, We've heard about employment of Africans. Let me raise two other equivalent issues that a lot of Western governments and agencies uh, feel concern about things like human rights in African countries and the environmental impact of development. It strikes me that China has made inroads into Africa by not worrying about either environmental or human rights issues. So two related questions. Do you see the time coming in the near future when China will be as concerned with these issues as Western agencies are? Meanwhile, do you think we're idiots for considering these issues when you can ride in, not worry about them, and do a lot more business? And I think that the Chinese government never, you know, not worry about the local conditions 
in Africa, including you know, some human rights violations, some corruption, and but Chinese government really, and according to our own principle, not publicly declare it. Sometimes behind the door, and even in government-to-government -government diplomatic dialogue, di dialogues, China talk with some you know, African governments, where China have investments, even have different interests, and we advise them, maybe, perhaps, should do things in this way and not necessarily in that way. But I don't think that China have rights and have self-confidence and have experience, should, you know, in frequent cases to impose our will upon them. Of course, on the other hand, China is a newcomer. And before, I think that before the 20th century, China exactly and have not any con contact with Atlantic, you know, countries. So China is a newcomer, and China have uh, shortcomings, but we are learning something. But one thing is certain, and uh, we don't think that we are in a position to impose some even suggesting advice upon local people, local governments. And of course, China is a secure member, uh, uh, a, member of permanent, a permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations, China, and sometimes China veto some resolution, but sometimes China <laughs> vote yes for some resolution, which this resolution have some meaning to improve social and political situation in some African countries. Uh, Victor Bush is from, from uh, Cape Verde. You want to comment? Thank you, Lisa. Uh, 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 I want to say, first of all, that I'm not speaking on behalf of African countries. Uh, I'm speaking on my own name because any time I speak, people tend to associate my thoughts to African countries. That's not the case. I will comment on, on what uh, the, the question of uh, my friend from South Africa and the response of the uh, professor. Well, perhaps China do not have a strategic paper, but it acts strategically. You have a lot of people in the world that perhaps do not know the word strategy, and yet they act strategically. Is that necessarily uh, a bad thing? I mean, shouldn't it have a strategy? I, I'm not judging. I am just uh, trying to make, to make it uh, comprehensible for, for, for me. And you have people speaking all the time because it's fashionable to use the word strategy that never acts in a strategic way. So we must, and I don't want to make a semantic, a debate, a debate on semantics, but in my view, and observing China presence in Africa, I believe that somehow there are elements of strategy for trade, for investment, and I also believe that when you have trade, investment, this can be translated in political and security issues, and this we cannot uh, deny. Uh, okay, yeah, actually, I do want you to go on uh, just very uh, briefly uh, on the end. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, so your take, your take is that uh, the aims in these Chinese investments are good or not, deleterious or not? You know, I, 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 I don't want to judge. What I think is that China's, China presence in Africa is not a bad thing. And it is an opportunity for African countries to diversify their partnership. When you listen to people from the United States and Europe, they are concerned about China presence in Africa. And I'm not judging, but for African countries, it's an opportunity to diversify. And the European and the United States are, are challenged to find a new way of dealing with African countries in terms of development, because development is the main challenge for Africa. Let me, let, let me give you an example. After having a good idea for a project with the World Bank, and managing the project cycle from identification, preparation, evaluation, et cetera, till the moment of uh, the, uh, starting the implementation, you need to count on four or five years sometimes. 
and because there is a lot of procedures, a lot of rules. And for African countries that are in need of infrastructure for their own development, this new approach uh, 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 can, be, uh, can represent a lot of advantage. This said, I believe that African countries, but also China, Brazil, uh, Mexico, uh, and the United States in Europe, must assess the past experience of their relationship. And I'm not so sure that we did a good assessment. Most of the time, we hear people expressing political emotion or judgment. It was good and it was not, it was not good, but judgment are not evaluation or yes. assessment. Yes, okay, so aside from just denigrating, figuring out what went wrong and, and what can be changed, mm -hmm. you're saying? Uh, Tatiana, you wanted to add to that. Yeah, I'd just like okay. to build on that to say that for Brazilians, it's quite clear what is the Chinese strategy in terms of trade and investment in Brazil. At first, uh, Chinese were interested in natural resources. A lot of investment in the oil sector, in the mining sector, strategic minerals. Then more recently, Chinese were interested in Brazil's internal market. By 2020, Brazil should be the fourth uh, largest consumer market in the world, and Chinese quickly realized that. So they're investing in Brazil in areas such as the automotive sector or telecommunication sector. This is fine. I mean, we're just trying to, to identify where our interests meet. But uh, it's, cl it's clear for us, for Brazilian generally speaking, that Chinese have a strategic uh, approach towards Brazil. Mm. Uh, the, uh, okay, uh, thank you, Jorge Castaneda. I, I rarely agree with my Chinese friends, but on this occasion, I, I do. I think the point that the professor is making is a very well-made well point. In the long term, it is possible that these very narrow, specific economic interests in Latin America and in Africa will require a broader strategic Chinese uh, projection, military, ideological, cultural, political, in the long term. Today, they don't. There are those people who think that this is inevitable. But today, it's not only a question of them not wanting to. China does not have the capability of that type of projection. It does not have a military projection capability. It does not have any cultural projection capability, and it has very little ideological projection capability. Can you define that projection capability? Yeah, you guys should do what we do. That's call it ideological capability. What the Americans have been doing for about 150 years, that. What you guys should do is what we do, okay? We have the best system in the world, the best political system, the best economic system, the best every system. Everybody in the world should be like the Americans. That's what the Americans say. The Chinese don't say that. They don't say, we don't care what you guys do. This is what you, we do, and you guys can go and do whatever the hell you want, even wear socks of a different color. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I think that the, I have a little disagreement with you. And the he problem was just is agreeing not, with you. The problem, like the problem is part. not the capability. <laughs> I think that if China have intention, have motivation, and China will send some at least military soldiers, or some military advisors, or even occasionally some fleet. But the problem is that, or that the China advantage is that, at this stage of history, China really have no intention to do things unilaterally and militarily in distant continent. Of course, I don't say that there's no possibility in the future, middle term future, long field future, China will not do something just like downward, you know, diplomacy. And China also have a possibility, go so-called imperialist load. We are in ancient times, uh, some years Chinese empire. But the Chinese in this stage of history, and leaders and elites and remind ourselves. Now you look at the fate of empire and the cost, failure. And so we should be careful. So in this stage of history, our strategic plan in Brazil, in Africa, in Latin America, all you know, general strategic plan for investment and trade and so and so. But of course, some things are in gray area. And some minerals, 
and oil and gas have strategic values. But in this stage of history, and why China go to this continent to search for oil and gas and mineral? Because domestic economic imperative is called, it might lead us go to so-called expansion and military even. But at this stage of history, and China still determined not going this way. Uh, let me let me ask you actually, if you don't mind, Victor, if I ask you um, uh, from a different <clears throat> excuse me from a, a different path, and that is, if we look at Africa, um, is it necessarily the recipient of investment from China and elsewhere, and is it ever? going to become the driver when we talk about uh, Africa's emergence as a continent, obviously with all the disparities in Africa. Um, I spoke to uh, uh, the gentleman who was here from Senegal earlier. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here, but he said, there is no way with all the problems that we have in Africa, um, from food supply to corruption um, to conflict, that we could be the driver at this point, and I am totally paraphrasing him. But, but what about Africa not just as the recipient? This is the huge challenge for African leadership. And uh, most of times, because of lack of leadership, African countries do not develop their own perspective of relationship with the world, with China, with Brazil, etc., and they just follow the perspective of partners' countries. And the big challenge for Africa, the, for me, is to develop their own strategy to deal with those partners. But in doing so, you have the problem of uh, leadership, uh, uh, capacities that sometimes do not exist. You can have elected government, but elected government does not mean that you have democratic governance, that you have government committed to development. And if Africa, and we are not far away from 2015, and it's a sad thing to see that most of African countries are not going to meet the Millennium Development Goals, so, in a situation of lack of development, with a lack of uh, human capacity and leadership, it is very difficult to manage this relationship with China, but also with the United States, with Europe, etc., etc. And this is the huge challenge, for, in my view, for Africa. It is capacity building, to deal with this complex issue and have their own perspective and not adopting the perspective of, 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 of partners. To establish its own projection capabilities then. But that, doesn't that leave a huge void if, it, if it's dealing with its own problems and doesn't have the ability then to have its own strategy and own project, projections? Some countries have. When, when, uh, you go to South Africa, you see that there is strategy and South Africa is in a pivotal situation because it's Indian Ocean, it's Atlantic, and there is this partnership between South Africa, India, and Brazil, and South Africa is in a situation that can play a positive role in this relationship between Africa and uh, Europe, China, and United States. But South Africa also need to achieve a lot of internal goals as much social peace, uh, less uh, socioeconomic uh, decalage, and uh, there is a lot of challenge. You have Angola that can play a, a very important role, Nigeria, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I wonder if, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Kerry McNamara is here. Um, are you Carrie, possibly? Uh, yes, do you mind if I call on you? <laughs> you're, you're being called on right now. Um, you, you gave some interesting um, uh, figures last night at the dinner where we were appropriately over dinner talking about food and food security issues. I wonder if you can repeat those with regard to Africa because one of the things that you said was um, that uh, African farmers, small farmers being those who provide most of the food for Africa, uh, 
are the solution, not the problem. The problem is not capacity. The problem is being able to get things, for instance, to market. And again, I don't mean to oversimplify what you're saying, but you had some very interesting figures. Could you tell us about them? Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, it's well known that African agriculture has much lower yields than agriculture in most other areas. And it's known that there are a variety of reasons for that, only one of which, only one of which is very low use of fertilizer compared to other, uh, to, compared to other continents. But what I was saying last night is that when you look at Africa's enormous opportunity for being a driver of food security going forward, um, it's a very complex problem that has to be ad addressed in all its complexity. It's not enough just to have smallholder farmers produce more crop on their land, increase their yields, as we say, because if they can't get that crop, that, that larger crop to market and get a good price for it, uh, they're not going to increase their yield. They're smart, they're smart people, they're survivors, especially if they have to buy several months in advance the inputs that would make possible those greater yields. So it's not just you know, increasing yields, which is a thing we hear about a lot, it's infrastructure, it's market linkages, it's helping smallholder farmers become more organized so that they can have more market power. Um, and it's creating the entire link between the, the, the farmer and national and global markets. And the reason I, I emphasize smallholders is that, you know, uh, tragically, the international community and African governments badly neglected underinvested, disinvested in agriculture in Africa for over 20 years, and they're finally coming around just in the last few years. And the reason that smallholder farming is important in Africa is because, as we've seen in too many other places, if you strip out the rural areas of large countries, what you end, with, end up with is populations that are largely concentrated in cities where a lot of them don't have jobs. And so uh, developing smallholder agriculture in Africa is not only about answering food security, it's not only about using agriculture as an engine of ec broader economic growth, uh, inclusive economic growth in African countries. Um, it's also fundamentally about stability because it's about creating rural livelihoods and rural economies that are sustainable. I wonder if we can move to Tatiana in terms of the agricultural boom that's happening throughout South America, but particularly in Brazil, and to what extent that uh, influences right now Brazil's stability and Brazil's abilities on the new stage in the Atlantic. Sure. Well, Brazil has invested uh, hugely in uh, research and development in the agricultural sector, and we are very uh, competitive in different agricultural products, for example, soy, and corn. Brazil will, uh, last year we, we reached uh, record highs of exports in soy and um, corn as well, but of course we export different kinds of products and, well, ethanol just to get to the energy sector as well. We have infrastructure problems, we're addressing those problems. We have just launched a plan to attract private investment for ports uh, and railroads uh, in Brazil. This is very important to improve even further our competitiveness in that area. We're very proud of what we've been able to, to build in the agricultural sector. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, at the larger picture of Brazil right now, let's talk a little bit about ambitions. I mean, we're talking about Chinese ambitions, getting different opinions on that. What does Brazil want in terms of its place on the international stage? You focus primarily on economics, on trade, I understand. So take it from that perspective. And then also if others want to express perhaps their uh, own interests on this or concerns as well. But uh, you start off, Tatiana. Thanks, Lisa. Let me uh, further focus on, the, interne on the, the economic aspect, maybe trade aspect of that. Yesterday, I listened with a lot of interest to uh, the US uh, and the European Union dialogue, discussions about the possible uh, trade and investment agreement. And uh, there was a lot of discussions about ambitions, uh, about how ambitious such an agreement would be. And uh, I asked myself if that would be the most ambitious uh, approach towards trade. And definitely there would be not, there would be not in case uh, this um, 
this, this venue is at the expense of the efforts in the multilateral trading system, at the expense of a broader, comprehensive and non-discriminatory trade liberalization. Some would think, would say, and I'm not quoting anyone here, that maybe if the European Union and the US would get together and define common standards, unified regulations, etc., etc., and then get back to the WTO members and say, well, here's what we have, maybe if you want, you can join us, uh, that would sound very, very ambitious. But I tell you, that wouldn't work in today's reality. Mm -hmm. That narrative somehow reminds me of the 1992 Blair House Agreement, where the US and the European Union sat together and finished the, uh, and closed the unfinished business of the then uh, Uruguay round. That, on that occasion, paved the way for the conclusion of the uh, Uruguay round that comprised uh, 123 members. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't work today. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't work today for many reasons, one of them being Brazil is more important, India is more important in multilateral matters, the BRICS that didn't exist them now uh, bring to the WTO not only Russia but China mainly. They were not part of the game on that occasion. Well, there are uh, so many aspects that, uh, I mean, would prevent that narrative to happen again. And it's important for us to be aware of the consequences of uh, creating a gap that probably wouldn't be bridged again and the results of that. The result of that, creating a gap, you know, uh, not being able to, to get back to the multilateral track, uh, would result in a multilateral system uh, limited to maybe a trade court that would uh, judge uh, our policies, everyone's policies, against rules that were defined. In the best scenario in early, mid-90s, the worst scenario in 1947. Mm -hmm. I think it's not very ambitious to get to that kind of result. This is something very important to have in mind. How about, <coughs> excuse me, I have some comments over here on, on, um, on, I think, on Brazil's ambitions. Oh, whatever. Go ahead. Can you identify yourself? Thank you. No official honor. I just wrapped up my ASMAS fellowship with the GMF, and I teach international relations in Istanbul, Turkey. Um, and my, I want to pick up on this theme of African and extra-African actors' ambitions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the continent, because we've heard China's role downplayed, and maybe it's a question of Asian modesty, but uh, from no, a no. Turkish no perspective... Okay. Chinese people are not calculated by modesty. This is fact. <laughs> from a, um, my, my, from my, nor, my. nor are Turkish people. And so from a, uh, when one is based in Istanbul, uh, one hears uh, a lot about Turkey's uh, ever more uh, um, proactive Africa policy. Um, and this may be a response to having been burned in Syria. But you have the Turkish foreign ministry opening up 15 new embassies this year. Um, you have the Turkish development agency increasing aid to over 100 million, which is still paltry, but um, it's, it's, it's there. Um, you you have Turkish faith-based organizations opening schools across the continent uh, in uh, very hard to reach areas. Uh, they're performing 60,000 cataract operations uh, for free alone in East Africa alone. Uh, you have the Turkish prime minister going on several world wind tours and making these the centerpiece of his UN speeches in a clear attempt to amplify an African presence into sort of a global governance uh, role. Um, and so my question is, uh, when one listens to discussion of this in Turkey, one would think uh, that Turkey is all over Africa and everyone is aware of this. Um, and are the Chinese and are the Brazilians and are the South Africans uh, aware of this uh, Turkish uh, presence and ambition? And if so, um, is the, um, our interest convergent or is, are there classing uh, interest at play? Sure. Yeah, I, I, I think that the, in China and the government and especially uh, you know, internet scholars in most of the years and began very keenly to aware a new phenomenon in world political economy, especially in world politics, and that's in Turkey. And we know that Turkey is very, you know, aspiring, and sometimes is ambitious. And Turkey is active, you know, the performance and in the international stage, and is almost in recent years dramatically increased and expanded. And we welcome this. But also, and I think that Turkey and is just like China, and uh, we are newcomers. Sometimes we could have mistakes. Sometimes we could have, you know, to raise you know, unreasonable 
in our eyes and others, you know, complaints or something just like that. So I think that we expected. And, uh, and uh, next stage of world, his, world politics is the age of rising powers. And Indians, Chinese, Brazos, Turkeys, and, uh, and other, other countries. I think that the, the really, and the uh, 21st century, and the will increase, and uh, people and nations' voice, and even participation of decision, and uh, who's, you know, the, 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 the political and economic rule in the modern world, and before, you know, today is quite, you know, low and uh, underestimated. Uh, Victor, I know you want to respond. Just, just to react to this uh, uh, um, intervention about Turkey, Yes, we speak about Brazil, about China and India, but there are a lot of new uh, actors in, in Africa, in Southern Atlantic, and Turkey, it has been noticed, and uh, Turkey has been very, very aggressive in, in showing presence in Africa, and uh, Turkey fight a lot to have a lot of United Nations conference on Africa mm -hmm. in Istanbul, and the last huge conference on less developed country was held in Istanbul. So it's Turkey, but it's Japan also, it's South Korea. You have a lot of countries trying to, to play a role in Africa, which is a huge challenge for African governments and African leadership, how to manage this diversity of, uh, of uh, partners and not being eaten away. Just a last comment for this issue of food security that I think is related to the issue of development. It's true that Africa has this huge challenge of valuing agriculture as an economic solution for its development. The problem is that during 80s, 70s, in spite of a man that I think I should mention, it was Jack Juf, the former director general of FAO, that advocated a lot for agriculture, but the problem we have now is that there is this investment, but there is also a mindset in African leadership, in the youth, that agriculture is not a modernity, that agriculture is synonymous of poverty. So the challenge is investing much more money to agriculture, supporting the small farmers, but also changing mindset of use to make them make peace with agriculture as a good solution for development, for food security, and for employment. Uh, Ragada wants to speak. Uh, I'm just about the BRICS diplomatic positions uh, taken at the Security Council. Uh, Brazil in particular probably was after the permanent pre uh, seat in the Security Council as they're speaking of reform. So maybe that drove the positions, but the BRICS really blocked a solution on Syria. And two years later, we don't know what uh, the individual countries are doing towards the refugees, two million of them, 800,000 of them children, uh, a catastrophe that's happening uh, as a consequence of doing nothing at the Security Council. And I'm wondering for uh, our Chinese professor if he would kindly address uh, the strategic interests of China when it comes to uh, twice or three times using the veto together with Russia, uh, in, in, in whereas your relationship with the GCC countries, uh, oil, of course, is part of the strategic interest, of course. Uh, I wonder if you dismiss their concern and their anger about your position. And I'm wondering if you have really processed uh, what does it cost you on the long run with the public, or at least half the public of the Arab region, to see you three times using a veto against something that they feel uh, is not uh, uh, serving their interests. How do you, do you, do you really care at all, strategically or strictly or not strictly? Do you care? Uh, I think uh, China is a sovereign country. And uh, not only a uh, you know, permanent member of the Security Council is a sovereign country. China has independent foreign policy. China has its own you know, principles. And of course, often uh, we are 
we have no you know, eye-to-eye -eye disagreement on some issues with our American friends and European friends. And sometimes also, and, uh, for example, Brazil or India as a sovereign country, sometimes they can take a different position with China. Over, over you know, issue of Syria and the Chinese the vote record in Security Council is five. Five times. Veto three times. Why veto? And I don't think that China will, in practical future, change its position. And if the Security Council resolution draft about Syria is from assumption that this is a bad guy, this is a good guy, then we, I, I think I, in the past three times, China veto it. And in the future, we we'll still veto this kind of resolution draft. But if the, another time, two times, China voted yes in the Security Council, because and the draft resolution have not, you know, based on assumption, this is bad guy, this is good guy. And uh, folks on, uh, you know, support Kofi Annan's mission. Folks on, uh, you know, the, the, the efforts on political solution and the dialogue and the process. And uh, I think, uh, of course, and the China's, this kind of position is not uh, very popular among many countries. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that the, in this kind of very important issue, eternal, uh, extremely important issue, I think that China's consideration, first of all, is not a popularity. And first of all is, you know, the, the, the principle and equal, positive, and as Chinese understand. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And Tatiana, um, and then also Jorge, and then we have some questions back here, and I'm gonna take a couple of questions very quickly, so maybe if we can start the microphone there, but Tatiana, you go first. Yeah, three quick comments in reaction to this uh, last question. First, we are very much concerned with the situation in Syria. Second, uh, there is no single voice for BRIC countries at the UN. Third, we do not have a seat, a permanent seat at Security Council. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes. Yeah, well, it's a good thing they don't. <laughs> because when they did on Libya, they abstained, together with the South Africans and the Indians. So what do you want a permanent seat for if all you do is abstain all the time? You want a, you want a permanent seat, you have to take stands. And Brazil does not want to take stands. It wants hands off, it wants to be nice and get along with everybody, which is wonderful. Stay away from the Security Council if that's what you want to do. The Tatiana, South Africans, you don't have to be nice yourself. The South Africans did the same know, thing. China sometimes also vote Epstein. I think that the yeah. internet is already have a seat. It's very complicated. They have, they have, they've sometimes had a seat for 50 vote years. Vote Epstein is taking a position. They don't, the Brazilians, yeah. the Indians, and the South Africans did not take a stand on Libya, and had they been members on Syria, they would not be taking a stand, because they would be inventing the same story, excuse me, that the Chinese and the Russians have said, which that Libya mission creep has made it impossible for the council now to act on Syria, which is why there is no Security Council action on Syria. If that is what they want to be members of the Security Council for, it's not worth it. And that, I think, is one of the reasons countries like Mexico and many others do not think it's a good idea for the P5 to be enlarged. Let's stick with the P5. They're the ones who have the veto. They're the ones who have been there for 60 years. And they're the ones who have a true cap capability, some more than others, to truly act in places like Syria, like Libya, like others. Tatiana. Yeah, I must respond to that, definitely. <laughs> Let me say that me maybe Mexico, I mean, would be willing to be there, but since there's no capability for Mexico to be and there, we it better stay with the five, because uh, it may be more convenient to stay with the five Absolutely. than to have an enlarged Security Council without Mexico. So this is something to keep in mind. Absolutely. Another aspect to be considered is that um, sometimes uh, Brazil is the country able to build bridges, to connect uh, some countries to others. This is a very important uh, capacity that Brazil has been able to build same and it can be, be of Turkey great value. Well. Same for Turkey, same for other countries. Mm -hmm. But this is an important capacity that Brazil has been able to, to build and we are confident that this can be very useful in finding solutions yeah, that the P5 cool. were unable to find so far. It was especially useful with Iran and Turkey. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's hear a couple of uh, very quick comments here. Why don't we take three comments, uh, actually one, two, three, and then we'll go around. 
Uh, my name is uh, Fumiyaki uh, Kubo at the Tokyo Foundation as well as the University of Tokyo. And uh, my question is uh, not from Atlantic but from a Pacific Ocean perspective, which is about the TPP uh, addressed to uh, Dr. Xi uh, Hong. Uh, what do you think of the TPP? Uh, are you suspicious that this might be an uh, uh, effort led by the United States to you know, exclude Chinese economic influence? Or, you know, or, or, or even that it has anti-China national security uh, implications? Or rather, do you think that uh, your government uh, will, might uh, express its intention to join the TPP you know, in the near future eventually? Thanks. And just briefly, for those who are on the web who don't know what TPP is? Uh, Trans-Pacific Pacific Partnership, FTA, among the, the Asia-Pacific countries. Thank you. If you can pass that down. I'm Patrick Worms from the World Agroforestry Center. I want to come back to the comment you made that African leaders and African youth consider agriculture to be uncool. There's a reason why they do that. That is because smallholder agriculture leads people into the classic poverty track that's, trap that's been so ably analyzed by Esther Duflo. But agricultural science has not stopped in the days of 50 or 60 years ago when the Green Revolution was first mooted. It has progressed, and agroecological principles now lead to success stories in places like Mali, Niger, Burkina, Malawi, where farm productivity increases so much that we have tantalizing signs that men are choosing to come back from the slums to the villages because the economic life they can build there is becoming more attractive than one they can make in the cities. This is bringing people out of the poverty track and it is going to make African agriculture more productive. Thank you, and one more point here. Well, uh, two things. I just wanted to correct Professor Castaneda because we have to consider, I'm Marcus Freitas from Brazil, Thank you. that Brazil has a large Syrian population, which is Catholic, Catholic Syrians, who kind of support the regime. So you have to understand that there is an internal constituency that you also need to think about. So that's something that I just wanted to emphasize from the beginning because I think there might be a mistake there. You have to understand that it is a local constituency, which is very important in Brazil because if you look into the Brazilian political environment, you see many Syrian descendants. So that's uh, issue number one. Now, the second thing I wanted to ask is that now that Chavez is gone, and I think that the topic is not China today, I thought it was the Atlantic, uh, my focus is this. Now that Ch uh, Chavez is gone, is there any way in which Brazil and Mexico could eventually work together to be the leaders in the region because effectively, Brazil is a country without leaders, and also is Mexico. So how can you both work together to make sure that Latin America has one single voice? And you know, as you negotiate with Europe and the United States, you become more effective into making this is still a Western Hemisphere century. That's my question. Let's take the last question first, then, thanks. Uh, either Tatiana or... Um, so, uh, uh, no, th sorry, the last question first sure. about Brazil and Mexico working together. No, on the Syrian constituency, I, I think that it's a, a very valid uh, concern in many cases in Brazil and in other countries. But every country has domestic constituencies and every country has domestic politics, especially all countries that aspire to a, either a regional or a world role. And although sometimes one can wonder whether the Americans, for example, are able to put um, their long-term national interests above the importance of the Jewish community in the United States, and one can wonder if that's the case. Nonetheless, one hopes that that would be the case. And what many people in this room, and I think elsewhere, for example, would hope is that now that President Obama is going finally to Israel and to the Middle East, he will be able to put American strategic national long-term interests above those right now of the Jewish community in the United States. So I think that should be worthwhile, a worthwhile reflection. On the other question, I mean, I, I think, despite what Tatiana may uh, uh, wonder about, I think Brazil is right on the Brazilian-Mexican rivalry, <laughs> and we Mexicans are wrong. Why are we wrong? Because we are the ones that insist, who insist on having a Latin American role. And we have no role to play in South America. This is just Mexican nostalgia. 
We like to think about these things, you know. Oh, there was a time when we all spoke Spanish. Of course, problem is the Brazilians speak Portuguese, but well, <laughs> co complicated. But, uh, we don't have a role to play in South America. We, I think we have a very important role to play in Central America and the Caribbean, which used to be called the Caribbean basis to, Basin, together with the Americans. But Brazil is more reasonable than us, with a few silly exceptions like Honduras. But other than small metidas de pata of that sort, uh, Brazil has been much more reasonable and not aspired to a major role in Central America or the Caribbean, and has concentrated its regional efforts in South America, which I think makes a lot of sense. So I don't think we should have a common Latin American voice. I think there are two Latin Americas, very clearly, Central America, Mexico, and the Caribbean on the one hand, with one type of economic and international integration with North America, and South America with a large Brazilian influence, much more commodity exporting, much more diversified in the world in trade, investment, and everything else than we are. All of our relations, the Central Americans, the Caribbean countries, and Mexico, the rest of the world for us is called the United States, period. The rest of the stuff is stories. This is not the case for South America, not the case for Brazil. I don't know what's better or what's worse, but I do know that these are facts which are relatively rigid, which we have not really been able to, to, to modify over the last hundred odd years. And I have serious doubts that we will be able to modify them. Um, Tatiana, should Brazil and could Brazil? Let me first say that I, would, I don't want to get into the specific stories of the region, etc. It's not time for that. Let me get to Marco's question. Uh, and in that sense, I would say that uh, it's too early to say what are the consequences of Chavez's death for the region. Uh, I would say that it was in Venezuela that prevented Brazil and Mexico to strengthen its relations. Uh, I understand there's a new administration in Mexico. The new uh, Mex Mexican president went to Brazil, had a very good meeting with President Dilma, and I understand this can open new venues for strengthening cooperation between the two countries. Did you Yes. Uh, TPP, yes. And the Chinese government never declared that China have a suspicion about the Pan-Obama initiative to launch, suddenly launch a TPP, and such a comprehensive, you know, free trade and negotiation plan. And, uh, but in China, and uh, most of the scholars, most of the, you know, public opinion uh, have suspicion, does have suspicions. Why? Because, and in despite of and Obama's repeated declaration that China is America, uh, America's uh, one of the most important trade partners. China is, you know, the, the American uh, relation with the United States is the uh, most important you know, bilateral relation the United States have in the 21st century. Have not informed the Chinese government in any degree before he launched this plan. And, uh, and after that, he have not consulted with the Chinese government. And so we have plausible as a as a private scholar, and we have plausible, you know, reasons to, you know, have some suspicion about, you know, not, e not economic motivation, but some Bible strategic motivation. And also, I think that the Chinese is very firm. And anyway, and China's first objective is to push, to promote, and a more practical sub-regional economic multilateral integration plan, and especially ASEAN plus one, ASEAN plus three, and China, Japan, Korea, and also Chinese government even during this very intensive confrontation over Diaoyu or Sankaku, and the Chinese government, and also, you know, take a positive attitude, and negotiate with Japan, negotiate with and, uh, Republic of Korea for this, you know, more practical sub-regional plan. And of course, and Chinese have, you know, Chinese government have no any rights to prevent or persuade any other governments to take part in the PPP, you know, T, uh, TPP negotiation. And but of course, and the Chinese scholars and Chinese media also have some suspicion. And why Prime Minister Abe, and in despite of, you know, domestic division, especially, you know, complaints and even objections <coughs> of Japanese farmers to declare a little too hurry to, you know, take part in the negotiation with the United States of Japanese membership for TPP. There is a strategic bipolar motivation. But China still have no any rights 
to interfere other people. Okay, even if she... TPP established, okay? Even if TPP established, and whether China decided to take part in, it's still China's sovereign rights. We will consider very seriously. Thank you. Question here. I'm John Richardson from the German Marshall Fund. Uh, one of the books which was shown up on the screen earlier is about um, maritime challenges in the Atlantic. It comes to the conclusion that economic activity is going to increase offshore in the maritime uh, sphere, particularly energy and, uh, and trade, and therefore shipping. But so will illegal activities, partly as a result of that. Illegal activities such as piracy, such as smuggling, um, drug trafficking, people trafficking, and that there is a bit of a vacuum because very few of the countries around the, Atlant the southern Atlantic basin have a capacity to interdict such illegal activity. It comes to the obvious conclusion that the South Atlantic countries need to uh, cooperate on this, uh, to, if, with increased domain surveillance, with increased Coast Guard cooperation. And such a cooperation would need leadership. One of the obvious countries to lead that would be Brazil. And so I have two questions for the panel. Would such Brazilian leadership on such a project be acceptable to the rest of the South Atlantic countries? That's for at least for two gentlemen on the left. And of course, for, uh, for Secretary Prazeras, would Brazil have the will to do that? And would it have the resources to put into the, the um, naval and Coast Guard capability which would be needed? Uh, and hold off on the answer. Excuse me. I'm going to bring this here. Thanks. Well, thank you. I'm Ana Palacio from uh, Spain and an addict to GMF's uh, uh, conferences. Um, allow me to start by a footnote to what uh, what Jorge Castaneda said about uh, the, the would-be new members of the Security Council. And I would say that in Libya there was another relevant member that abstained, in Germany. Germany, bearing in mind that both Great Britain and France took a very clear, uh, very clear position, and bearing in mind that we have something that is called the European Union with all of us. But this is just a footnote. And frankly, I think that, yes, that uh, a, I mean, there is a trajectory to have a, an active foreign policy. And an active foreign policy means an active foreign policy. And I'm, I fully agree with you that just abstaining is not an active foreign policy in general. I've been some cases. My question, and I, I'm sorry that it's quite late, was about foreign investment. The world today is about foreign investment, and in particular, there is no development without foreign investment. However, the, uh, before, foreign investment meant rich country, with, which means the uh, United States, Europe, Japan, investing in developing countries. Today, it's not the case. Today, there is a lot of South-South investment. However, there is still the same preconceived ideas about international protection of foreign investment. We have uh, clear cases in Latin America, not to speak of other, in uh, Bolivia or in Argentina, and of course in Africa. I would like to see m more of a debate, and especially if you allowed me to uh, make my last comment, is that China, which is a raising power, is not at all in this business of international law. It's much more on bilateral negotiations. What is the role for <coughs> international law in uh, investment protection? Okay, we're gonna stockpile. So keep in mind, um, I'm sorry, we're gonna need short answers. We have about eight minutes left. Just yeah, hold yeah, on yeah, one very second. Quick, very quick. Yeah, sorry, one more point. My name is Gian Giacomo Milone. I come from Italy. And Italy is a middle-sized power. Most of us are, but the difference is, as the Polish foreign minister said, some of us know it and others don't know it. So there are two ways we can go. Either we can try to move upwards to being part of the directorates, you know, or be against them when we are excluded from them and be in favor of them when we are included. And I don't think this is very useful. We could use our middle-sized privilege, or also newcomers, you know, to think if there is a common good with which of the world, of international organizations that we want to strengthen, and that our national interest 
coincides, in our case, in making Europe as such stronger, the United Nations as such, and maybe start looking, rather than joining, you know, permanent membership, that which we cannot do, rather look critically on the privileges of the permanent members and open a new discourse about, a, shall we call it, democratization of international organizations. Um, good comment, and, and a couple of questions, if we can hit them fairly briefly. I apologize for that, and then I'm gonna to go to this side of the room and we'll wrap up. Um, who, did you wanna yes. first? Concerning this issue of leadership, and Brazil could play a role in the Southern Atlantic, but I believe that we have leaderships and not one leadership, and sure enough, Brazil could play a very important role, but I believe that also that Brazil has this challenge of understanding the past experience of, for instance, <laughs> African relationship with uh, Europe. With If it doesn't understand this, there is the risk. I'm not saying that uh, it's happening, but there is the risk of taking the same old ways uh, leading to the same old problems. And uh, as the spectation in Africa, as I see it, concerning Brazil are very, very high. Brazil must understand this. Someone was speaking about agriculture. A lot of African countries are trusting on Brazil to bring technology, to bring a lot of savoir-faire, to help them uh, uh, um, with uh, this renewal of, of agriculture. So, because you have on the African side, Nigeria, you have the regional entities, you have South Africa, you have Angola, you have countries that will, have, will want to play a role. Concerning the piracy issue, we go back to this issue someone raised in the beginning of environment also and development. Because if you go to the delta of Niger, Niger in Niger, Nigeria, it's not Chinese enterprise, you will, have, you will find a mess on environmental uh, agriculture, fishing, etc. It's finished. So it's not just to say China, it's a lot of company this concern. And that's why it's important for Africa and its relationship with China, assessing with, with accuracy their past experience. Concerning the uh, foreign direct investment. Very briefly. Yes. I believe that all African countries is working on creating legislations and regulation that uh, protect foreign direct investment, in spite of what you said about China. Uh, yeah, yes, Dr. Xi. I think in Chinese understanding, international law have two, uh, generally have roughly two forms. One is that uh, bilateral agreement between sovereign states in international law treatment, and also multilateral. And, uh, and sometimes China and I prefer to go bilaterally because it is, can avoid some, you know, sophistications and compl co uh, complexities and to make things more effective and more quick. But of, of course, China never oppose. And if there is international treaty to have some international protection of foreign direct investments. But often this is not, you know, you know quick and uh, effective. And uh, for example, Libya, and uh, since you know, shortly since the Secret Council passed the American, you know, sponsored the resolution. Next day, and uh, there is war, and China have to withdraw in a very emerging basis, and uh, three, uh, so this on the Chinese, you know, workers and uh, great investment. But of course, and if there is in the future, and there is internet discussion or even within the United Secret Council, and China will actively participate in. But China will be prudent because China's memory and have some 19th century you know, record and some, some international you know, protection of investments become imposed upon you know, native countries and China will treat, you know, you try to avoid that. And of course, and you can say China is more 
very cons conservative. Yes, China's conservative. Okay, I promise this woman one final comment and then we'll and, move on. Um, Terry Givens, University of Texas at Austin, and I've heard a lot of, we, we, this conference is about the fragility of the global system, and I haven't heard, we, there's been some reference to some of the conflicts going on, but I'm wondering how some of these conflicts in Northern Africa and Africa may uh, impact the global Atlantic, and including the uh, fiscal crisis going on in Europe as well. Okay, uh, if you want to take that, Victor, very briefly. I, I believe that, uh, when you, you speak about uh, fragility, people tend to think about security issues, military issues, but the fragility we are living in France, in, in Africa, that will impact the world is poverty, is the issue of development, of this leadership responsibility, but it's a world challenge also because uh, globalization is mobility and uh, all this situation can be translated in threats for security. So development issue is on the center of this fragility team. Thank you. And I just want to say that so much of what we have talked about during this entire conference has pertained to human capability and natural resources. And I would just like to say that the Brussels Forum, and I think many of you will agree, provides food for the mind, fertile ground for relationships to take root and grow, which as we know is key in this interconnected world, and the energy to jolt us into coming up with creative solutions to the complex problems that we're facing. Power up. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. What a great session. Thank you.